Hey Spuddies, Potato McWhiskey here and welcome to a game that I have waited a very long time for, Victoria 3. It's finally here, I cannot believe it. It is pre-release and I have probably put 70 hours into this game just so that I could create this beautiful tutorial series for you and I'll be able to teach you the game. So when you load up the game, you're going to start a new game that is going to be basically the only thing you could do and you have a variety of choices here. These four first, first four choices will basically allow you to generate in-game objectives that will guide you through your gameplay. For example, if I choose learn the game I can pick any four of these recommended countries or I can go into the game and select a country and the game will dynamically generate me missions based on the objective that I've decided upon here. I would recommend your first game, play and learn the game country. What I did was like, I immediately jumped into the game and started playing Persia because Persia is my favorite nation to play in Victoria 3. But today we're going to be playing Japan. People voted for Japan and we're going to be playing Japan in the hedge money objective. Uh, these objectives aren't necessary for you to do. They just give you an idea of how to guide your country towards the objective of global dominance. We could, of course, play Japan with the goal of making an egalitarian society or economic dominance. Hedge of money though, that's going to be the goal for Japan. So you're probably wondering, what the hell is Victoria 3? Well, Victoria 3 is a game set in what I would consider to be the most important era of history, okay? And it is the period immediately after the Napoleonic era and immediately before World War I. If you know anything about world history, you know that this era literally every social, political, economic conflict that has happened in the last hundred years stems from things that happened in this time frame. Now, during this time, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, is the world's premier power, okay? The Kingdom, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, they have a population of 26 million people. Now, that's just Great Britain itself. That is not even taking into account all of the various minor vassal countries, right? We have the Hudson Bay Company, we have Lower Canada, Upper Canada, Columbia Districts. These are all vassals of the United Kingdom. I'm pretty sure they have a, a spot down here. They own a Cape Colony. They own bits of Africa. They own the entirety of India. The East India Company has over 122 million people. The United Kingdom I'm pretty sure, controls something like 15 to 20% of the world's population right now. Great Britain. And there are a variety of old empires. Prussia was the precursor to Germany. Austria was the kingdom of Austria-Hungary. Well, I think it's still just the Austrian Empire. It becomes Austria-Hungary during this time frame. France is arguably currently the greatest land military power in the game. Uh, soon to be superseded by Prussia and potentially Russia, depending on how they play their cards. France has some holdings over here in the Caribbean, has a little bit in Africa, and they will potentially expand over towards uh, here. I think they have like a little trading port over here too. The Ottoman Empire still exists, okay? The heir to Byzantium, or the conquerors of Byzantium, depending on how you want to look at it, they exist. And unfortunately for the Ottoman Empire, this is arguably... <laughs> as This is where the groundwork is laid, laid for the Ottoman Empire to collapse. To fall and become what is now modern Turkey and all of the successor states in Western Asia, Middle East. Persia is a unified country. You know, we, we all the countries in the world are here. This is when the world was changed and became the world that it is today. This is when socialism was born. This is when fascism was born. This is when liberalism was born. This is when capitalism was invented. All of these massive political social movements were born in this game's time frame, and that's why I love this game. And we are going to be playing as what is arguably the most difficult backwater feudal empire in the game. Japan. Now, a lot of people were upset that I picked Japan. They were like, don't play Japan. Japan is easy. And I was laughing to myself so hard because they have no idea how Japan plays in Victoria 3. Let me tell you, Japan is in an incredibly precarious situation, politically, economically, from a resource perspective, from a military perspective. Japan, like, let's take a look at Japan. All right, let's have a look at the demographics. If we come over here to the population screen, we can see that Japan has 26 million peasants, 2 million laborers, a million clergymen, half a million aristocrats. Look at this, There, there's no academics. There's no people, there's no reformers in this country. This is just an incredibly entrenched feudal society that we have to turn into an industrial superpower. We have to try to conquer, you know, bits of here, maybe try and get an African colony. We have so much ahead of us and even worse, right? We'll take a look at our laws, okay? We have censorship, serfdom, child labor. Women have no rights. There's no social security. There's no migration. Slavery is banned, which is a plus. But we have a traditionalist economic system, which means many modes of production and trade policies and stuff. We have no trade policy. We literally cannot trade with anyone. Our taxation is based on land. 
which is the second least efficient way of generating government revenue in this game. You could argue that's actually a pretty reasonable way to do tax stuff, but we want per capita or some of these down here. We can't do any colonialism. We have some police. We have no schools, no health system. The, the political system is a monarchy, autocracy. We have national supremacy. Racial minorities are uh, discriminated against. We do have freedom of conscience. That's one thing. We don't have a state religion. We may want to go to state religion, though. The reason why we might want to go to state religion is because... If we go to state religion, we'll increase the political power of the Buddhist monks, but also, more importantly, it would allow us to pass religious schools, which would increase our education. Come on, game. There we go. Education access and increase our conversion rate. So, you know, things to consider. There's lots of political, there's so much to consider. And I don't even know where I begin to explain this game because every system in this game is interlinked, intertwined, and just completely building upon itself. I suppose the simplest place to start talking about are, what are my early game goals? What are the first things that I want to achieve? And then that will naturally lead to me talking about the various things that I'm going to be doing to try to achieve those. So I suppose the very first thing that we want to do is to colonize uh, the Ainu Mosir. The reason for that is because this area actually has gold mines, or at least it will have gold mines. Gold mines are discoverable here, and this will lead, it's just a really efficient way for us to generate revenue for our government. So we want to get the gold, we want to colonize North the, the Ainu Island. Now, how do we do that? Well, first, we have to come down here to our political screen and we have to establish a colony, right? However, the problem is we don't produce any colonial growth. Well, how the hell do we produce colonial growth? We have to pass colonial resettlement or colonial exploitation. So we have to change the laws of our country. So how does that work? I can't click these buttons. Well, you'll see here, in order to pass colonial affairs, we have to invent col colonization. So we have to go over to the tech screen, come over here and start re researching colonization. But here's the really crazy thing is Japan has a lot of political problems with its science. We're only generating 50 weekly innovation. We can generate up to 82.18 because of our literacy, but we're only generating 50. That's the base value. Now, really importantly is there is a passive technology spread in this game, but because Japan is one of the most isolated insular nations in the entire game, we get literally the worst technology spread in the game, which means we're going to have to build universities, academies, and these are expensive. And they also don't increase our GDP. <laughs> And GDP is an important piece of gameplay data that I will talk about in a little while. So you can already see, just by wanting to pass colonization, I've already interacted with like four systems and I haven't even fully explained all of them. So I'm hoping you're starting to see why I love the Victoria series of games. Anyway, the second part of passing colonial affairs is getting a party in power inside our government that endorses the change. Now, the nice thing is we actually currently have, if we go out to our political screen and we look at our overview, currently the shoguns and the samurai are in power in our country, and that is giving us a really good chance to pass certain laws. However, the downside is if we want to liberalize our society, they are going to fight us at every turn. You can see here, we have a 79 percent opposition to just going to a presidential republic. If we wanted to go to oligarchy, we have huge resistance. The only thing that we don't have resistance to is landed voting. So that might be something we might move to. And the reason why we might want to move to landed voting is because if we take a look at autocracy, it's increasing the political strength of aristocrats inside our country. And aristocrats are one of the primary supporters of the Shogunate political party. See, if I go here and I look at this, how do I show you that it's aristocrats? I think I click on this and you can see, yeah, there you go. The primary supporters of the Shogunate political party are aristocrats. So we need to figure out how to weaken the political power of aristocrats. And one of the best ways to do that is to pass landed voting, because this will keep the aristocrats vote strong, but it will add extra votes to the capitalist, clergymen and officers, which will, by its nature, dilute the political power of the aristocrats. However, this comes with some downsides, right? Autocracy gives us a ton of authority, which is another game mechanic that I have yet to talk about. A ton of legitimacy, which is another game mechanic I have yet to talk about. So <laughs> this is just a big complex web of things all interacting, and it'll be a long time before we ever unpause this game while I explain my strategy here. So we could go for immediately to landed voting. However, if we take a look at the political parties that will support this, industrialists actually support this pretty well, as well as the intelligentsia. I could go ahead and start trying to pass this, but I think I would like to get the success rate up slightly. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to the intelligentsia and I'm going to bolster them. This will give them a 40% impact on the interest group attraction, meaning that they will attract more population to supporting them, giving them more political power, more clout in my country. So I'm going to bolster the intelligentsia because the intelligentsia will support reform. Now, the second way that I can improve the power of the intelligentsia is to build buildings that employ people who will support the intelligentsia. A good example of that 
would be universities. But I can't build universities yet because I haven't researched academia, but I need to research colonization. So I'm going to do colonization first, then we'll look into academia. This will allow us to build universities. Universities will employ academics and clergymen and laborers and clerks, but we can make it employ 2,000 academics who will support the intelligentsia, which will increase the political power of the intelligentsia, thus diluting the political power of all the other parties that oppose the reforms that we want to make. Okay. <laughs> it's starting to get complicated. But believe me, it's only the beginning, because I haven't even talked about the economy of our country. I haven't even talked about the fact that every single one of the pieces of our country here, like if we take a look here at the province of Kansai, it has a variety of buildings, it has a variety of population. All of these people are producing and doing things. If we go to our unused arable land, this is basically undeveloped rural land, okay? We have agriculture, we have developed rural land here, and then we have undeveloped rural land here. You can see we've got 1.6 million peasants working, well 1.7, working this undeveloped land producing a variety of goods. This is really really inefficient production um, for a number of reasons because there's no production bonuses, it doesn't benefit from technology, it scales based just on population. But also if we take a look at these peasants, um, their wage is really really low. If you look at their net income, um, how do I show the there is a way to show this. Yeah, if you just look at their standard of living, the standard of living is really, really low. How do I show their per pop wage? I don't remember how to do that. Ah, there it is. Annual wage per annual income per working adult is 0 0.59. So they're basically making like 60 pence a year. Okay, if we go ahead and look at, for example, another agricult agricultural building, like a tea plantation, and we take a look at perhaps even just laborers working on this thing, they're making nearly, what, five times that? They're making nearly three pounds a year just being laborers on tea plantations. And then that's not even to talk about the farmers who should be making quite a bit more. Yeah, yeah, they're making four and a half pound a year. So um, one of the things that we want to do is to increase the velocity of money in our country and increase the quantity of money in our country. <laughs> God, I'm somewhere in here, this game will start to make sense, I promise you. So what is the velocity of money? Essentially, think of money as a renewable resource. It's like blood, okay? It flows around your country. Money never gets destroyed, it only gets created. It's like, it's like reverse entropy, okay? So two things we wanna do in order to expand our economy is to increase the supply of money. We'll talk about how to do that. Um, we also want to increase the amount of times money exchanges hands because the amount of times money exchanges hands increases the number of opportunities we have to tax people and increases the total GDP of our country. Let me go ahead and set up a really, really simple example. If we take a look here at these logging camps, okay? Logging camps produce 30 wood at a baseline value for four and a half thousand laborers, right? Plus an extra 5,000 shopkeepers. And then I can use construction sectors or a variety of other sources of use, right? Paper mills, glassworks, um, shipyards, urban centers. They can purchase wood to create some other good. And everyone is making money and exchanging money in this process, okay? For ex one, one good example is the construction sector because that loops in with me, right? I, I build a logging camp to produce wood by spending the wood that logging camps produce. So imagine that as a two-step cycle, okay? However, there's multiple cycles following off of that because all the population that's employed in the construction sector and employed in the logging camp, they also go and try to buy goods from all the other areas of my market. But let's say I wanted to more efficiently produce wood. I would go to my logging camps and I would say, hey, you know, if you were to use tools in your production here, right? You would consume five tools, but you would double your production rate. Well, how the hell do I get tools? Well, then I would have to build a tool factory, which can use iron and wood. And the more complex the economic chain of buildings I have together, the more times money is exchanging hands, thus the quality of living and the wages of my people goes up. So that's how, so building complex chains of buildings, which I will talk about more in detail, is how we increase the velocity and number of times money and resources are exchanged in my country. How do we increase the money supply? Well, the two main ways we increase money supply is by growing our GDP, which will then lead to minting. Um, we are allowed to mint a certain amount of our GDP per year in cash. This cash goes directly into my treasury, which I then spend on a variety of goods and services and wages, which will then go back into my economy, producing tax revenue, producing all sorts of stuff. Additionally, every single population unit I have in my country has dependents, right? So this would be like their wives and their children, and they will generate a very, very small amount of money that flows into my economy, which is then, you know, I tax it. I, you know, so these things are all, it's, it's a very big, very complicated system, all working together. And our goal is to try to increase the total amount of money in our country and the total number of times the money exchanges hands, because that will lead to GDP growth. And with GDP growth means 
we can build more buildings more quickly, we will have more money, we can conquer more territory. So that's the economic fundamentals of what we're trying to do here. <laughs> I really hope you guys follow that because this game is big, it is complicated, but it is so much fun when you start to understand it. So <laughs> what the hell does that have to do with us trying to do colonization? Okay, well, let me explain. So I want to build lumber mills to increase the total amount of wood available in my country because right now there is a deficit of wood. You can see here, sell orders for wood, a total about 986, whereas buy orders for wood, total about 1,000.100. And what this effectively means is everyone is able to get wood. There's no shortage of wood. It's just wood is 10% more expensive than it should be. So there's a little bit more demand than there is supply for wood. And this is bad for me because I am a consumer of wood. Right? You can see here, construction goods. I'm spending 3.2k on wood, and that's 9% more than I should be spending on wood because wood is expensive in my country. So what can I do to immediately and quickly increase the supply of wood in my country? Well, very, very simply, the simplest way is if I come over here to the building tab and I click on rural and I scroll down to logging camps and I go to my logging camps and I switch production to tools. However, let us take a moment to study this change because predicted impact on weekly balance with full employment after goods substitution. So this will actually negatively impact the lumber industry in my country for two reasons. First of all, because the price of wood will shoot down to almost nothing and the price of tools will shoot up to its maximum price. And the portion of laborers in my, in my logging camp industry will go down and the proportion of machinists will go up and machinists demand a higher wage because they're more skilled laborers. So how do I prevent that from happening? Well, first of all, the big problem that we have is if we go to our industrial goods, our country is not actually producing tools. So the very first thing that I should do is I should come over here and I should start building a tooling workshop. But before I build a tooling workshop, I have to talk about construction efficiency and decrees. So much to talk about. This is the decree screen. These are special local level things that we can put in our country. So, for example, if I were to put road maintenance, this will give me a 25% infrastructure bonus and 10% state construction efficiency. What is state, conf well, infrastructure is pretty straightforward. Infrastructure is the limit of the total number of buildings that you can build in a single province before you start to suffer market access problems. Every single province that is producing resources um, goes into your market. You can see here, this is the Japanese market. It goes into the Japanese market. If you do not have an infrastructure, if you don't have enough infrastructure in your state, in an individual state, it will have trouble buying and selling goods in the market, thus making things more expensive locally or cheaper locally, depending on the access to the market. Our goal should be to avoid ever having less than 100%. You can kind of get by with less than 100%, but we should avoid it because uh, high market access is actually a really efficient way to play the game. What the hell is construction efficiency? Well, construction efficiency is basically fairly simple. Our country produces a certain amount of construction points that is then used to build buildings. These buildings will then employ people. So I'll go back to the example here of the, well, let's say tea plantation, okay? Uh, this is a level four tea plantation and every level of building employs at a baseline 5,000 people, which means this building is employing 20,000 people of a variety of different classes. But you'll notice they're all different classes, right? So tea plantations employ aristocrats, clergymen and farmers and laborers. Now, the really important thing for us with construction efficiency is construction efficiency allows us to turn this consumption of construction goods into more total construction power without consuming more goods. So by placing a 10% road maintenance ability and focusing my construction in this location, I am effectively getting more construction for less input goods. It's just an efficiency thing. It's super worth doing, super good to do. Um, so the very first thing that we're going to be building is actually a tooling workshop. Tooling workshops produce tools, which I can then consume in my logging camps to increase the total amount of wood, which will lower the cost of my construction goods, which means I can construct more, so on and so forth. However, we're building this really, really, really slowly. So I'm going to burn a little bit of my gold reserves by building two extra construction sectors in my capital state first, and each construction sector will employ 5,000 people and produce two construction and half a percentage point of state construction efficiency, so it'll make my future constructions even more efficient. However, this will burn my gold reserves a little bit because they will start demanding goods that are in short supply and so on and so forth, and they'll demand more goods. But this is going to be part of the game. And look, we have now unpaused it. Now, fortunately, we are losing... There's, there's like a few you know, things here that we could talk about. One of the things that we could do is declare interests. I think it would be our first declared interest should be down here in um, Oceania. Oceania. Basically, a declared interest is essentially you saying, I have an interest in any diplomatic go goings on in here. If somebody is looking to declare war, like let's say, for example, the Great Britain has an interest in, let's say, 
the Western Asia here, the Middle East. Let's say Nejd wanted to declare war on Jabal Shamar. Well, the United Kingdom could go, actually, I have an interest in this conflict and I'm going to back Nejd. And so that's basically what this means. And so by saying that I have a political interest in Oceania here, that means I can start doing things like making colonies or intervening in any revolutions or any battles or any wars down here. Right, uh, so I never actually got to explain why I want my lumber mills to consume tools. I want my lumber mills to consume tools because the baseline production method here is merchant guilds, which employs shopkeepers. If you look here, this will employ 500 shopkeepers. However, if I change the production method on this side to sawmills, this will instead employ capitalists and capitalists they support the industrialist and intelligentsia agenda which will allow me to dilute the political power of the shogunate thus allowing me to reform the government of japan so it took me about 25 minutes to get to the point of explaining how we're going to be diluting the power of the shogunate and it is by building buildings <laughs> Welcome to Victoria 3. Japan is actually quite a challenging com country to play in this particular game. So let's go ahead and take a look at the construction. This is just about to finish in one week. Uh, the game goes by in multiple ticks per day and then every week your economy produces and consumes resources. So you can see this is now has an employment of 6,000 and the construction production amount is starting to go up, which means we're going to be building buildings faster. However, it also means that the total amount of resources that we're consuming on our industry is going up. And basically what we want to do is to use our gold reserves efficiently. We can go into debt and we can go into quite a lot of debt. Uh, gold reserves are what I would, gold reserves are bad. They're not bad, but basically this is money that isn't flowing around my economy. Does that make sense? I want that money to get into my economy. So by building a couple of extra construction sectors, I increase the price of wood. My GDP should increase ever so slightly and so on and so forth. And now the price of wood is up to 25%. So one of our early game goals is to get as much construction power as possible because the more construction power we have, the faster we can increase the GDP of our economy, which will increase the amount of pounds that we can mint. But also more importantly, it will increase the standard of living of our population. And the higher the standard of living of our population, the more our population will grow, the more they will produce, the more they will generate tax revenue. It's all just really, really good stuff. I actually still have a... Um, um, positive cash flow here so I'm going to go ahead and build myself an extra construction sector I just I don't want to be losing gold reserves yet but I want to try to get my gold reserves down to a neutral level I want I want my gold reserves to neither be increasing or decreasing and I would like to have a little bit of gold reserve in the bank our construction power is slowly increasing it will go up to about 15 and 15 is a pretty good place place to be and we're going to get this tooling workshop relatively quickly now the important thing to note about this is yes we're producing 15 construction power but we're getting an extra 15% construction power. So that 15 construction is getting converted into 17.32 construction, which is pretty close to the maximum efficiency. You can only put 20 construction power into a single building at a time. And we want to get to that point as soon as possible. But yeah, now we're building really, really quickly, but we're still positive on cash flow. Now, something else we might want to do is to open up our diplomatic actions and just to improve relations with a couple of great powers. I think improving relations with Great Britain is always a good one. Um, it makes them less likely to go to war with you. And improving relations with Russia is also a good one because right now, we are an incredibly vulnerable and weak nation. So we want to play things like slowly and carefully and make friends with people. We just don't want a lot of enemies yet. So we are very, very slowly burning our gold reserves. But that's like, this is like nothing. Okay, I've been minus 10k, 20k, 40k per, per week before. This, is, this, this amount of spending is nothing compared to where we can be. Oh, a couple of things I totally forgot to talk about is um, every building in the game has a variety of production methods and you will unlock better ones as the game goes on. For example, if we take a look at these textile mills, um, right now they're producing 270 cloth because there's six of them. So um, on a per textile mill basis, that's um, 15 and five, right? So we could, you know, or uh, sorry, 45 and 40, but it's multiplied by two because there's two textile mills here, right? Does that make sense? Um, let me show you that. Can I show you that in this here? Yeah, if you look at textile mills, normally they will produce, they will produce 20 luxury clothes and 25 normal clothes for 30 fabric and 10 silk, right? That makes sense. But as we unlock new technology, we can build more complex production chains. And remember, the more, remember, the more complex the production chain is, the more total resources are being consumed, which means the more total times money is being exchanged in your economy, thus increasing your GDP. Our tooling workshop is about to finish. And this will give me an opportunity to talk about more complex production chains. Now we could sit here and we could just produce tools, right? It'll consume 30 wood to produce 30, it'll consume 30 wood to produce 30 tools. That 30, those 30 tools could be used in my logging industry to produce a bunch more wood. Like uh, if I come down here and I show you this Chukogu, this four size lump logging camp will consume 20 tools to produce an extra 120 wood. So thus, 
by building a factory, we've massively increased the productivity of this building. However, the tooling workshop itself, right now, if I look at my total economy for logging camps, I need to consume 55 tools to supply my entire logging industry. So I need to produce 55 tools to supply my entire logging industry with the wood, with the tools required to produce this much wood, which will increase the qualification and education and money level. I haven't even talked about all that stuff, but it'll increase the quality of life of these 5,000 population and allow me to employ capitalists here by allowing me to switch to privately owned. So in order, and a single one of these tooling workshops only produces um, 30 tools. But if I go to pig iron tools, which allows it to consume iron, it will produce another 30 tools, which means I need to go down here. I need to build an iron mine so that I can supply this with the iron it needs to make more tools. So you can start to see how this incredibly complicated building chain of a vertical economy. Now you can go wide economy where you stay at an incredibly low tech level and you just build a lot of stuff. I like to build a vertical economy because I think it is a more satisfying and engaging way to play the game, personally. Um, there are going to be certain production methods that we're going to avoid. The example I can give here in the tooling workshop is, uh, you can see here, these water tube boilers. This just allows you to use coal to employ less people in the building. However, we have a massive population compared to most of the countries in the game. So we don't need really anything that reduces the total number of population and um, that works. But also, really importantly, by switching to pig iron tools, this will switch this from being a building owned by merchant guilds to being a privately owned building who are capitalists. Capitalists who will eventually support this marginalized political group, the industrialists, who are who I want to get into power because the industrialists support the abolishment of serfdom. Right now we have serfdom. Serfdom is really, really bad. Plus serfdom is making the shogunate more powerful. If we can get rid of serfdom, we are on our way to the path to reform. So we need to make sure that the industrialists are no longer marginalized. God, it's such a big and complicated and difficult game. But my God, is it a satisfying experience. So until this iron mine is completed, we will just be producing tools regularly. We will go over to our economy and we will switch over some, but not all of our logging camps. We'll switch over four and two, and we should see a relatively large bump to our GDP, but also uh, the price of tools is really, really high, but the high price of tools will increase the profitability of our tooling workshop, meaning that they are actually producing a large weekly cash balance. Now, unfortunately, the game is a little bit of a zero sum game in some respects when it comes to that, because this by contrast means in these places that are consuming tools, it means that they have a shortage and they're making less profit. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a zero sum game. They're still profitable, but they're not doing great. But this in particular means that if we check over here, you could see this is when I started building my construction industry, the consumption of wood went up and then I switched over to producing tools and the price of wood went down, but it's also climbing back up because there's a shortage of tools. So our goal is to try to get the construction cost of wood down because that'll allow us to expand our ability to construct. It's like a whole cycle. It's a whole thing. There's a whole thing going on here. It's all beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a beautiful, complex chain, and I haven't even begun to interact with many of the complicated, beautiful systems that are in this game. I've only just begun to scratch the surface. Like, I haven't even begun to explain why I'm building factories in my capital state rather than anywhere else. And the reason for that is really simple. It's because political pops, pops with political power, have more political power if they're in your capital state. So if I concentrate all my capitalists in here, and eventually I plan to disband all these plantations, because that's where you get more aristocrats, I can increase the political power concentration of capitalists here, thus increasing the political power of the industrialists, allowing me to pass better laws. We have our first random event here. Ooh! Opium addiction. Yikes. So this is going to hurt our standard of living and, lo and increase our mortality. What this will do is, um, how do I show you this population here? You can see mortality, birth rate is dictated by the standard of living. Death rate is dictated by the standard of living as well as child labor and a variety of other effects. Higher standard of living people are more likely to um, have children. Uh, you have to understand, I think I think it, it scales off though towards, you know, basically these people are poor, they have no access to healthcare, so they're, they're having trouble growing their population. Does that make sense, right? These are just incredibly poor, destitute people. They have really high mortality rate for their children, all that sort of stuff. This is the era where all of that changes. This is the transition from the old world to the new world. We're doing it, we're changing Japan, and we've only played like two years of game time. Here we go, the most important development. We have some capitalists, they exist. They work in my logging camps. Look at these beautiful capitalists. Look at them, they have political power. They support the industrialists. The industrialist clout will slowly climb. Now, the important thing is they also support the intelligentsia, so the intelligentsia clout will also climb. But either way, that's good for me. So we just completed the iron mines in Shukoku. Now, the big problem with this iron mine that we have right now, um, I, have to let, I think I have to let a week pass so they can try to employ some people. So yes, the big problem this iron mine has is that it's producing iron, but nobody is buying iron. You see here, I have zero buy orders in my country, and iron is used uh, only in 
productive industries. There's a lot of goods in the game that are actually bought by population. So for example, if we take a look at grain, grain is consumed by pops of wealth levels 1 to 29 to meet their basic food needs. And they'll also con- consume a variety of other goods to also meet those needs. But something like iron is only used by industry. And in particular, iron is going to be used by our tooling industry. We're going to switch to pig iron tools. And then because that will increase the total amount of tools in my country, I can then come over to my wood production lines and start building more sawmills. You can see here, this will increase the good production. It'll increase the cost of tools, but they should start to stabilize. Iron is super expensive right now. Tools are, they kind of jumped and fell in price, which is totally reasonable. And wood, we're slowly bringing that wood price down to that equilibrium. In my opinion, you want your prices of your goods to be somewhere in the region of at their base price, plus or minus 5%. So 10% is a lot, right? So I'd say even plus or minus 3% is in a really good place like cloth right now. That's like in the sweet spot for good price because it means it's not too expensive as an input good. It's also not too expensive for people to buy, but it's also very profitable at that rate. So you want to keep your goods at a relatively good price. Now, of course, by bringing down the price of wood and increasing the total GDP of my nation, you can see the GDP rate is growing very, very slowly. This will go vertical eventually um, as we get better at the game. This will allow me to now expand my construction sector again. So that's what I'm going to do. Expanding my construction sector will increase the amount of wood being demanded, which will mean then I can justify building more logging camps. I'm going to build one. I want to increase... Yeah, I'm going to build six logging camps and then I will build myself another tooling workshop and another iron mine. And then this is just like the very, very basic production chain that I'm working on. And the goal here is to try to increase the total number of capitalists in my capital state by building logging camps and making sure that we're doing the sawmills production method, because then that means we have privately owned. It means we're employing capitalists. And by increasing the total number of capitalists, has the imp- has the industrialists started? You could see this is like a very, very slight increase as we slowly get more capitalists. We're building that up. But more importantly, you can see the political power of the Japanese shogunate is slowly coming down. It's going to be a very long, a very slow, and a very difficult process to erode the power of the shoguns. But yes, now that we have the beginnings of economy, I'm going to start going into deficit spending. I'm going to start spending more money than I bring in because I also have a, I can also increase taxes and lower wages and also pass consumption taxes. I don't want to pass consumption taxes yet. I want to very, I want to very gently scale up my economy and my consumption of resources. I don't want to put too much strain on my economy yet. The price of wood has increased up to about plus 18%. So once we finish all of these logging camps, we should see it start to trickle back down. But as we complete those logging camps, we should see the price of tools start to climb again. And then we will build a tool, a tooling workshop, which will then increase the price of wood and iron again, which is currently perfectly balanced. And so you can see we're slowly building up this economic engine. And don't forget all of these people that are now working in these tooling workshops, right? If we look at this workforce, these guys are impoverished. But like if we check, take a look at their wages, right? This guy is earning £3.7 per month. If he was working in these crappy, crappy peasant fields, he would be earning £0.71 per year. It's nothing. So yes, he is still poor, but he's way better off than he was, which means the average quality of life in this area is slowly climbing as we industrialize it. Um, and that also has really important implications in general, because if we take a look at machinists, their literacy education access is dependent upon their uh, wealth level. So as they become more wealthy, they will get better access to education. The higher their education, the more likely they are to become politically active. The more likely they are to become politically active, the more they will dilute the political power of the shoguns. So we want to increase the quality of life, right? The shoguns power comes from ha- us having a huge, poor, impoverished, uneducated peasant population. So we want to change that. We want to get rid of the shoguns. We want to make our people literate. We want to make them well-educated and well, well-waged, well well-paid. Uh, so it's probably time we talk a little bit about buildings and all the consumption and use of resources. Buildings have a productivity level. This, I believe, is, if you look here, it's a relative measure of how much economic value a building generates per employee per year. So this is generating about 12.9 pounds per year per employee, which is a pretty damn good rate if you look at this here, right? It's the 55 most productive logging camp in the world, and it's the 300th most productivity, productive building, most productive building in the world, and it has over 351% more productivity than the average buildings. This is a very incredibly productive building. So the difference between the average annual wage and the building's weekly balance is known as profit. Now, these profits, what they do is first they go in and they build up the building's cash reserves. And the important thing about cash reserves is when we finally decide to get rid of our gold reserves and go into debt, the cash reserves of this building are what we borrow against. And then any interest we pay on that debt is paid to the capitalists in charge of this building. Now, capitalists, when they fully filled up this cash reserve, they will 
start contributing to an investment pool. We'll talk a little bit more about the investment pool when it comes up, but basically they're going to be subsidizing the construction of buildings in our country. Um, now, capitalists, on the other hand, they are incredibly secure, right? They they have they draw a huge wage. If I show this here, they're making fifty one pounds per working adult, which is probably a good time to actually talk about uh, the workforce. So, there's a population of one point six thousand capitalists in this area. However, only four hundred of them are a part of the workforce. Why is that? Because we have a workforce ratio of twenty five percent. Because twenty five percent of capitalists will work. That's because women generally don't have the right to be considered full workers in our country right now. We can change that later with our laws. If I go to um, legal guardianship, we can go to women's suffrage, which will increase the workforce ratio. It'll bring us up to a much higher ratio of our population actually working. And it'll also make um, women more politically active, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but we have completed colonization, which is going to trigger the first reform of our government, which will be either colonial resettlement or colonial exploitation. Now, either of these is actually viable, in my opinion. So if we take a look at colonial resettlement, this will have 100% migration attraction in unincorporated states. It'll enable the colonial affairs institution, but it will also increase more bu bureaucracy. However, this will provide us with colonial affairs, which will give us 0.1 colonial growth generation. Let's talk through all of these things in turn. So what is migration attraction and what is unincorporated states? Every province in your country here, you can see here, if I click through, they have this thing right here called attraction. This is your migration attraction. Now, currently in Japan, we have closed borders, which means our population can't migrate around even within our own country. We're going to eventually want to change that. So migration attraction basically says, how likely is a population from one state to move from another state? If I go ahead and I have a look here, um, can I show? Here you go. So if we take a look at Greater Poland here, uh, this has a really high migration attraction because of colonial resettlement. So there's a ton of Russian people or just people all over the Russian Empire moving here because this is an unincorporated state. Unincorporated states are a type of state. If I can I show this. So like, let's say we looked at Moscow here. Moscow is an incorporated state, which means people who live here, they get the benefit of institutions like, for example, public health care, uh, public schools, you know, local police forces, all those institutions that a country builds, they benefit from them. However, they are also taxed as a result. Unincorporated states don't benefit from any institutions. They don't have any political strength. Well, they have some interest strength, I think. They can't vote in elections. However, they are exempt from taxation. So there are upsides and downsides to living in an unincorporated state. And there's an upside and downside for you having an unincorporated state. So basically, this law will increase the migration to unincorporated states. And that might be really useful to you because let's say, for example, us as Japan, and this is kind of foreshadowing for the future, if we were to colonize this South Island here of, of New Zealand, there are actually, I believe, potentially gold mines down here. And so if we find gold mines and we have Japanese people move there, those Japanese people are going to be really rich because they're working at gold mines. And then that money will also flow into my treasury. So ba -ba 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 -bum, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum. you can see how that might be something that we look into. So how do we continue to explain colonial affairs? However, there's more stuff here. This will enable the colonial affairs institution. Basically, your country can have institutions. They will fill up in this screen. Right now we have the law enforcement institution and institutions can have a variety of levels. Institutions will have effects. So for example, law enforcement, because we have the local police force law, and there's four types of police force. You can have no police force, local, dedicated, militarized. Because we have local police force, this has a per level effect. And the per level effect is a 10% boost in the shogunate political strength and minus 20% state penalties from turmoil. We'll talk about turmoil in a second. So basically we could level this all the way up to level five. Um, and there's a few reasons we can't do that because we need to like have the bureaucracy. I haven't even talked about bureaucracy. Oh my God, there's so much to talk about. But this would give 50% shogunate political strength and minus 100% state penalties from turmoil. What the hell is turmoil? I need to find a state with turmoil to show that. Um, turmoil. Usually you can find turmoil where there's like colonialism going on. Okay, basically the sim simplest way I can describe turmoil is it's unrest. That's what turmoil is. It's unrest. We're going to start researching academia, by the way, because we want to build some colleges. Um, so what's this? This just is just a way for you to spend bureaucracy to reduce the negative effects of unrest. Essentially, that's what law enforcement does. Now, there's a variety of types of law enforcement, and they will actually have different effects depending on the type of law enforcement you have passed, right? So local police force makes your landowner strong because they're basically just here to protect the local uh, nobles while avoiding the penalties from unrest. Whereas a dedicated police force 
these will lower uh, the number of radicals you get from standard of living decreases. As the, if the standard of living in your country goes down, people will become more rag radicalized against your government. You can see here, nearly half a million people are angry from decreases in the standard of living in this country. On the flip side of that, there are loyalists. Uh, we are gaining some loyalists who are happy with our government because they've seen an increase in standard of living. You're going to initially um, have a lot of radicals because you're changing the country's economic system very drastically, which is going to negatively affect some people while positively affecting others. So people are going to be split. And then you have militarized police force, which is, uh, it makes your military faction stronger but increases the amount of people who die from turmoil. So this is basically like violent repression. However, it reduces the amount of radicals from discrimination, um, from standard of living decreases, and lowers the penalties from turmoil. So kind of an interesting web of decisions. Now, how does that hook? So we, we, were, we were talking about colonialism, Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, by passing colonial settlement, this will create an institution in my country called the Colonial Affairs, which will appear in here and we will be able to invest into it up to five levels, which will increase the rate at which we can colonize new regions. So we are going to do that. Now, the question is, do we want colonial resettlement, which will give migration and attraction in unincorporated states, thus increasing how many of our Japanese accepted pops will move to these newly colonized areas or do we want colonial exploitation which will this is essentially like the repressive version it will lower the wages and subsistence output of the people who live off the land it will lower it will make it harder to live peacefully with the native decentralized nations however it will give you throughput which means if we build buildings in this area we will get a lot of resources so this is much more about like let's say this Let's say we had a piece of land that produces an incredibly critical resource that we really need in order to sustain our economy. We might for go for colonial exploitation because our goal is to exploit an existing population by building infrastructure for them to work in. Colonial resettlement, on the other hand, is kind of a little bit more... It's exploitative, but it's the less exploitative choice. It's mostly just like, oh, we're building towns, we're building villages, people are moving in. It's still colonialism, but it's less heavy on the exploitation. I'm going to go for colonial resettlement because a lot of the places that we want to colonize actually don't have very big populations. If we take a look here at the South Island, there's a population of only like 60,000 people. So we're going to have to move Japanese people there. And the best way to move Japanese people there is to have a high attraction so that eventually when we pass migration laws, we can move Japanese people there. God, <laughs> so much to talk about in a single thing. So now we are trying to pass a law. <laughs> I have to talk about passing laws now. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to this game. So the basically, when you are trying to pass a law, it will have a variety of effects. So based on the political clout of political parties in your country, you will have a success chance. So you can see 57% of the clout in this country endorses colonial resettlement. The shogunate endorses it, the samurai endorse it, and the petty bourgeoisie endor endorse it. Okay, So that means when we get a checkpoint tick, Every, the baseline rate is 180 days. When we get a checkpoint tick, there's a 57% chance that we will pass this law. It's probably easier if I look at it here. You can see, there's a 52% chance that we'll pass the law. That's because one of the petty bourgeoisie aren't in my government. I haven't talked about that yet. I could, for example, bring the petty bourgeoisie into my government. However, that would increase my chance of passing the law, but it would lower my legitimacy. And legitimacy would mean the time between ticks to succeed would be longer. Does that make sense? So we, we could e increase the success rate of each individual tick, but lower the, but increase the time in between those ticks by bringing the petty bourgeoisie into the government. I think we don't need the petty bourgeoisie for that. We don't need the success rate. We have a 52, but this is like insanely high. Um, and there's four possible outcomes when a law changing tick happens. We can have a success, an advance, or a debate, or a stall. A success is basically just the law passes. No problem. It happens. An advance is you will get a increase to your success chance. A debate will typically give you a choice between a positive a chance to increase the success of this at the cost of a political negative, for example, upsetting one of your political groups, or increasing the happiness of your political groups while lowering the success chance. And those decisions are going to be complicated and difficult because if a political group has enough power and they get upset, they will rebel. Debate is... I talked about debate. And then stall is basically, it just lowers your success chance. So it's a little bit RNG, but it's kind of a fun RNG because it creates a lot of drama about whether or not you're going to be able to reform your country, which is why I think Japan is actually quite a difficult country to play in this game because of how powerful the shogunate is. They block a lot of laws. Like, for example, I would love to get rid of serfdom. The shogunate, 52% chance that they just say no. They just, nope, no serfdom abolished, which is why we have to dilute their political power. So this is like, 
it's it, hopefully it's all starting to circle together now when you are in the process of passing a law it will massively make the political factions that support that law happy for example you could see here the shogunate is getting a boost of five happiness from this making them super happy the samurai is super happy with this the petty bourgeoisie are super happy with this however the peasants are not so happy with this. In fact, they are radicalized because we are trying to do colonialism. However, the peasants aren't really strong enough to rebel, so we don't really care too much. And you can see here, this is being reflected in their happiness. Each political group in your country will have a variety of happiness and unhappiness states. And depending on their happiness and unhappiness, they will actually refuse to be in government. They will try to rebel. They will do a variety of things. Their pops will start to radicalize. They will start to organize rebellions. They'll start to organize political movements to change your laws. They'll organize political movements to do independence. They'll start to do all all kinds of crazy shit if you start trying to change your laws too quickly which is why we have to try to dilute the political power of the shogunate it's all it all comes back to that but if your if your political groups in your country are happy or unhappy they actually provide benefits and negatives here you can see active interest group traits so you can see here because the shogunate because the shogunate is really really happy we are getting a 20 percent bonus to the aristocrat investment pool contribution so you can see here investment pool transfer basically any building that employs aristocrats that is profitable is now contributing to the construction cost of my country because I'm building economic buildings. So how do I show this? Uh, yeah, so you can see here, this rice farm, uh, it's a level one rice farm that's employing a decent amount of capitalists, right? It's employing uh, 100 aristocrats and those 100 aristocrats are donating a little bit of their profits from this building to the country's construction budget, right? So this is like just them reinvesting back into the country. So by keeping the shogunate really happy, you can actually build up your economy really quickly. This effect is being doubled because they have more than 20% of the political clout in the country. However, political groups can also have negatives. Take, for example, the peasants here who are really, really angry with me. They are reducing my technology spread by 10%. However, they're not really politically strong enough, so they're only having half the normal effect. They're only having a 10% effect. Whereas this one here, the noblesse obligé, they have a 100% effect because they are a powerful interest group, which is basically means that they have their clout above 20%. So we're getting a bunch of positive and negative effects on our country because of the happiness of our political groups. Like, for example, our armies are just fighting more effectively because the samurai are really happy with me. Our military technology cost is just cheaper because the samurai are really happy with me. We're getting 10% more bureaucracy because the petty bourgeoisie are more happy with me. God, I haven't talked about bureaucracy. Oh, right. I keep forgetting to talk about bureaucracy. So basically, bureaucracy is an upkeep resource that is required to maintain the institutions and taxation of your country. If you ever have a shortfall of bureaucracy, you will be inefficiently taxing your country. A variety of things use up your bureaucracy. Incorporated states use up your bureaucracy. You can see here, um, incorporated state, it's using up 187 bureaucracy. This is partially due to the size of the population, but also partially due to the institution cost, which is based on the size of the population. We also have really inefficient taxation right now. So that's something we might want to address in the near to distant future. These are all things we'll talk about. But suffice to say, as we try to build a more powerful, more complicated government of institutions, we will need more bureaucracy. As our country gets bigger, we will need more bureaucracy. It is essentially a resource like any other that we will need to build. I hope you guys are starting to see why I love this game so much. I just, ah, oh, I love Victoria. I love Victoria 2. I love Victoria 3. This is just, this is, this is my kind of game. It's just so many moving, complicated, interacting parts and systems and it's all happening. And we've only gone through like three years of gameplay and there's a hundred years. So we have a duel between two of our guys. We take a look here. This is the samurai leader of the political party. And then this is the leader of the Buddhist monks. So an interesting thing here, we have a few choices that we can do. The first thing we can do is we let them fight. and There's a 50-50 chance that either of them dies. We can stop the duel, which will lower the popularity of these two political parties. I would do that if it was the shogunate, or we can just ban dueling, which will prevent this from happening in the future. I, what I want to do is I want to let these guys fight. And it's for a very particular reason. I want to let these guys fight because not only do political parties have individual policies and stuff that they will endorse, you can see here, um, the shogunate is paternalistic, right? So they endorse monarchy, landed voting, hereditary bureaucrats, local police force, traditionalism, isolation, mercantilism. They endorse all of those things, right? However, the leader of a political party can have a political stance that overrides all of that. So by cycling out political leaders of political parties that I don't like by, you know, like letting them kill each other, I could potentially get someone who is a reformer, which would allow 45% of the political power in my country to either not oppose or support potential really important reforms in my country. So really, really important to think about who is the political leader of your political parties as well. What political decisions do they support? What political decisions do they oppose? so much to talk about. Oh, one thing that I totally... Did I already do this? I don't remember. It was in my urban buildings. 
Yes. So I want to switch to bureaucrats because bureaucrats primarily support the intelligentsia and petty bourgeoisie, who are both reformists. These are my government administration. Basically, I'm going to switch away from having an administrative clergy. uh, And that's because clergymen primarily support Buddhist monks who are a political force in my country. They do support some things that I like, like charity hospitals and religious schools. Those are things I'm okay with. However, they they kind of oppose a lot of the reforms that I want. And the intelligentsia, I want to I want to reinforce the power of the intelligentsia at every single possible turn. So I'm going to come down here to my government administration and switch to a secular administration. This will cost me a little bit of money, but in the long run, it'll increase the political power of bureaucrats in my country, thus increasing the political power of the intelligentsia in my country, which is slowly, very, very slowly getting stronger. As you can see, the clout for the industrialists is slowly climbing as I build more and more capitalists. And because capitalists are so rich, they have more political power. You have to understand there's no voting in this country. So political power is almost entirely based upon your wealth and your education and your connections. So educated, wealthy people like capitalists and aristocrats are going to be the people who hold all the political power in my incredibly, you know, autocratic, undemocratic country. So if I increase the number of rich, wealthy, politically connected people who support the things that I want to support, it's going to be the way that to build the future towards voting that I want. So we just got done building a round of logging camps, which has brought the price of wood down in my country. However, they are starting to consume a lot of tools, which is bringing the price of tools up, which is why I'm now building a tooling workshop. And then that tooling workshop is going to need iron. So that's why we're also building iron mines. And then we're continuing to build logging camps. And the reason why we're building logging camps is because logging camps are one of the earliest buildings that can employ capitalists. These capitalists are in my capital state, which is giving them a 25% boost to their political power, which means they're more likely to support reforms and stuff in my country. So I want to increase the number of capitalists and academics in my capital state, which is why I'm currently researching academia so I can start turning my rather large surplus of money into extra research, but also political power in the academia. The academia is going to be one of my strongest allies in reforming Japan. So the first tick of colonial resettlement has passed and we got an event here called Colonial uh, enthusiasm. If I click on this, um, the news that the government has to pass colonial resettlement law has created a great enthusiasm of those who are either eager to exploit new lands. So we have a variety of choices here. We can say get a 20% enactment success chance. We can get 10% extra prestige for two years with a 10% enactment chance, or we can get 50% colony growth speed for two years and a 10% enactment success chance. Yeah, I suppose extra colony growth speed seems fine for an extra 10%. We, statistically, we should get it in two to three cycles, I would say. Like, the, it would be very, very rare if we did not pass this reasonably quickly. There is a very, very small potential stall here. There is a political movement here called Preserve No Colonial Affairs being backed by the peasants. Their radicalism is low. Their clout is low. So their ability to stop this is relatively low. However, it does exist. So it's not completely unopposed. You can see the GDP of my nation from the start of the game in 1936 has increased a significant amount. Ideally, we would like to get up into a relatively high GDP level. And we also need to increase our prestige, which is increased primarily by being like just a really big, powerful, strong country. But also by increasing our GDP, we are minting. You can see there's a slight gap here, which means we are minting more and more cash. So the second tooling workshop just came online, which means that now it's producing more tools, which should start to bring the price of tools back down to a more reasonable level. You can see right there, the price of tools is now shooting down, which means all of those Lumber camps have just become more profitable, right? The profitability of these lumber camps has just shot up because tools just went down in price. However, now they're consuming more iron, which means the price of iron is shooting up, which is why we're building iron mines. So you can see, even at the tier one technology level, where we have very little in the way of a complicated ecosystem for our country, we're still getting very complicated chains of effects. And that will get really, really complicated when we start using things like steel and coal and all this stuff in oil. Now, of course, because the price of tools is so low and the cost of iron is so high, this building is actually no longer profitable. So it's actually burning cash reserves to keep itself open. However, once we build another iron mine and the supply of iron comes to a more reasonable level, this building will return to profitability, especially because iron mines actually use tools as well. So one of our primary goals is to reduce the cost of construction goods, thus bringing down the amount that we're spending on construction goods, which means we could spend more in other areas. Right now, wood, is still quite expensive. I want to get that down a little bit more. Um, And don't forget, the more wood that we produce, the cheaper it is for our entire market, which means the more our people are consuming, which will increase their quality of life. And also, another thing to consider is every time I build a building, 5,000 people who will be working on these subsistence farms 
you know, produce, being very, very economically inefficient. And these subsistence farms produce a variety of goods, right? Furniture, clothing, services, wa- uh, liquor, wood, cloth, uh, grain. They'll no longer be producing that variety of goods. Instead, they'll be producing one good really efficiently, but they still need to buy all those other goods. So by employing people in these logging camps, I'm actually increasing the demand for goods. You can see there's a very, very slight increase in the demand for clothing. There's a very, very slight increase in the demand for furniture. A very, very slight increase. Well, it's kind of going up and down a little bit for services, right? All these things are a part of the chain of effects, the complex chain of effects that are going to be happening in your game. Leader of the Samurai is very fire speech. Okay, so we can get a 15% enactment success chance or a 10% and popularity of the Samurai. I think I'll just take the 15%. We're up to a 75% success chance. So we got a really, really good chance of it passing. It's actually quite unlucky. I've passed things on my first thing when I had a 5% success chance. Now, keep in mind, right? We're on our third uh, debate cycle for this law. And we have overwhelming support for colonialism in our government, okay? The support for abolishing serfdom is at like 19%. The support for making women have rights is at like 7.9%, okay? It's going to be incredibly hard to politically reform Japan. So that's why I was laughing when people were like, what are you doing? Japan is easy. And I'm like, <laughs> you have no idea, dude. You have no idea. Now, some other buildings we can start to build is we want to build livestock ranches. We could build cotton plantations, which are a really efficient way to produce fabric. However, I like building livestock ranches. Um, it's because later on, can I show you a livestock ranch? Uh, later on, they can do intensive grazing, which will produce fertilizer, which can then be used in farms to produce more food. So that's why I like livestock ranches. Whereas if you compare that to just cotton plantations, do I have any? I have no cotton plantations, but basically cotton plantations only ever produce fabric. I prefer the more complicated livestock ranch, even if that means I have to build more stuff. Now, the downside of building livestock ranches is that it does increase the political power of aristocrats, but we're going to be building them outside of the capital so that the political power is a little bit more diluted. So where do I want to build a specialist? Yeah, over here. Wait, where's where's Kobe? I'm pretty sure it's like in the south, right? Oh, Kobe is like right here. Yeah, yeah, there's Kobe. So Kobe beef comes from here. Well, I want to use the infrastructure in my capital city to generate as many capitalists as possible. So I'm going to build my livestock ranches. These are going to be, um, these are going to be Tohaku beef. So what's the current deficit of cloth in my country? It's only about 20. So I built five livestock ranches just to make cloth a little bit cheaper. Uh, the livestock ranches will also have the side effect of producing a little bit of meat to feed my population. We've built all of the lumber mills that we want to build has brought wood down to the exact equilibrium price. Now we could drive down the price of wood, right? Which would lower the cost of our construction goods. However, that would severely impact the profitability of these logging camps. Now we might not care about that. We might not care that these are profitable. That might be something that we accept, that we will just drive these into unprofitability and we will live with that. But I think I like to have profitable buildings because they pay out dividends and all that positive stuff. And that I think profitable buildings increases your GDP. I don't remember. All right, perfect. So we have founded colonial resettlement. This um, allows us to have the colonial affairs institution. So we are now a colonial power. We have finished our first mission. So if we come over here to the institutions in our country, we now have the colonial affairs institution, which gives us 0.1 colonial growth generation. We can upgrade it to level two, which we will likely want to do, which will force us to increase our bureaucracy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But now... We can establish a colony here in Hokkaido, and Hokkaido should by now... No, it hasn't found its gold mines yet. But basically, every 50 days, we will take a piece of this colony. This this decentralized nation. You can see here, there is a, uh, there's actually a country here. This is... Uh, yes, here we go. This is Ainu Masir. These are a decentralized country. They are essentially a, a loosely conglomerate of people, right? Uh, you'll find a lot of decentralized countries in Africa. These are countries that are frankly just too disorganized to resist colonial oppression. Like these people will still exist, but they're going to be underneath our political influence, right? Just by colonizing here doesn't like get rid of all the people that live in Loango. They'll just now exist inside our centralized country. Um, so we want to colonize this. And if we could as well, get a little bit of a colonization going on Sakhalin would be pretty good. And then there's also potential colonization efforts down here in Oceania, right? We could colonize New Zealand. We, there's a few like little islands around here and we could potentially conquer Hawaii before the USA gets it. I don't even know what's going on in the United States of America right now. I prefer not to look at that absolute clusterfuck. But there's a ton of stuff for us to colonize in the in the Pacific. And there's also a ton of countries for us to attack and vassalize, right? Um, and I think vassalizing countries will be an important part of our long-term play. By vassalizing countries, you will take a portion of their income, which you could then feed into your economy. And even if they eventually break away from your country, haha, it doesn't matter. I stole all your 
your money for a couple of hundred years and now my country is much more richer and much more powerful than yours as a result. Uh, art imitates life, as it were. Um, so that's going to be the conclusion of the very first episode. We have passed colonialism. We've explained a whole lot of game mechanics and we have played exactly three years of a 100-year game. I love you all very much and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.